Knock out. Believe it or not, we're finished with First and Second Corinthians. First uh, Corinthians covered most of the topics in terms of Christian character that um, we don't need to go into Second Corinthians for that particular aspect of study. And we're moving into the book of Romans. And again, we're going sequentially through Paul's writings. Uh, they're, uh, that is, chronologically. They're not chronologically ordered in our New Testament that we have, but rather by length. And so we are going by uh, chronology to the best that we understand it. Now, I'll give you just a little bit of background uh, to the book of Romans. And as I have said, um, we're not going to talk about a lot of the uh, deep and essential doctrinal theology that Paul presents when you look at other commentators uh, about the book of Romans. They will say what a tremendous influence this book has had on history and people like... Um, uh, Martin Luther and um, uh, other <laughs> famous people whose names escape me right now. Um, they have been influenced by, in some cases, just passing by and hearing a sermons about Romans or reading Romans in the course of their uh, Bible readings and discovering some real truths about uh, sin and about God's relationship to man and man's relationship to God. So we'll naturally come across some of those things, but we don't get to what I want to look at in the book of Romans, which is Paul's advice about how to live as a Christian. And we're going to begin in chapter 12 to look at that study. So there's a lot of valuable stuff in one through 11. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we won't cover that we'll skip over, but we're going to be looking specifically at those issues involving Christian character and Paul's advice about how you're supposed to live. Now, one of the things that has relatively recently come to my understanding, and it's essential in Paul's teaching, and really an essential part of Paul's teaching, is that we tend to think and maybe I'm out on a limb here assuming that it's uh, true for most of us, but we tend to think that the Old Testament way uh, for salvation is through the sacrifices and the ceremonies and the faithful execution of things uh, in temple worship and individual worship. And that in the New Testament, our way to be saved, the thing that brings us our salvation, salvation simply being a way for God to forgive and overlook our sinful nature and sinful behavior and to come into his presence as a righteous person, not because of anything we have done but fully by the grace and provision of Christ. His death paying the penalty for our sin and his resurrection proving that we have victory beyond this mortal life. And that is theologically, I think, somewhat askew. Because as Paul says in the book of Romans, he said, look, you, you guys are hung up on Jewish tradition and you're hung up on Jewish ceremony and you're hung up on circumcision and you think that you need to continue to do those things because you think that that's what saves you and makes you righteous. And then what Paul points out is, who was the first person of the Hebrew people who was labeled as righteous because of his faith 
in God's character and provision. And who was that person? Abraham. So Abraham was given, was credited righteousness because of his faith in God's character and promise before the Ten Commandments came along, before the tribe of Levi and all those things came along, before the tabernacle was made, before the temple was built, before circumcision was instituted. And so Abraham didn't have to do any of those things to be counted as righteous, but to have a humility of heart that says, I know you're God, I know that you're gonna fulfill your promises, I'm going to be devoted to you solely and lay behind all of those other ungodly practices. Now, Abraham was not perfect. We see some pretty shocking things uh, in his life as we move along in the Old Testament, just like we do uh, virtually every character. Uh, but it was, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, I'm not the numbers guy in my family. I'm not the accountant in my family. I'm not even the checkbook register keeper in our family. <laughs> Um, I have my own account, yes. and that is primarily for the purpose of not screwing up the family account. <laughs> um, but I do know that you've got to figure out how all of your ins and outs, expenses and income, balance so that you don't go into a deficit and end up a debtor. And again, using that accounting analogy to the extent that I am able to do so, we are in debt to God because the things that we have done and the thoughts that we have thought and every inclination of our heart, contrary to modern uh, psychology, that, that the inclination of our heart is against God and withdraws from our holiness tank and capacity and account. So we are in debt, we are at a great deficit. And the only way for that accounting to, to even out is for God to erase all of our debt so that we have only righteousness left. And that again has to come through the grace and provision of God himself by the means of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and continued presence at the right hand of God the Father. So understanding that, we then move into the question that we have pondered over the time of this series is why, why should I be good? What, what good does it do? Well, what good did it do to follow all of those particular minute um, annoying rules that you read when you slog through the book of Leviticus? Because God wanted his people to live in such a unique way that others would know that they are specially called by God. Now again, for those that want to debate free will versus predestination, God chose Abraham to be the father of many nations, not because of any merit, but simply because of God's sovereign will. Now we see throughout the history of the Hebrew people that they have rebelled on many, many occasions and have exercised their own free will to disobey God. So that is there. We also know that the Bible instructs the Hebrew people that if a stranger or another believer wants to come into the Jewish community, they can integrate into the Jewish community through circumcision, 
and following all these recommendations, these mandates, these rules. So we can think about the prohibition against certain foods because God knew that pork was not healthy and that lobster was not healthy or that, you know, at that particular time, the way that they would, would I know some of you are like, thank you, being a Gentile. Um, but that's, and there may be some truth to that, you know, the, the washing and the cleansing and those kinds of things. But, but I, I believe that it was primarily that, that they are so different from the rest of the pagan world that they really stand out. No, I can't eat that. Why? Gospel conversation. Um, we have to do this. We have to, we have to pay our, our temple tax and our, our tithe, and, and we have to bring uh, the best uh, to God. Well, wh why do you do that? These other people aren't doing it just quite that way. Gospel conversation. So, by the same token, the reasons that we try to behave differently as a Christ follower is one, is we follow Christ, and so we want to imitate Christ. That would make sense. We want to be like the one to whom our lives have been devoted. And so we want to do, uh, we want to live life answering the little bracelet question, what would Jesus do? Uh, secondly, we don't want to be unholy in this life when we're going to be in the presence of God and actually judging his angels in the next life if we have chosen the Lordship of Christ and have accepted his offer to live with him eternity. So why not begin to prepare our sanctification to our ultimate sanctification? But also, in a humble way, and not in a pretentious way, and not in a self-righteous way, we live in a way that is different from the world so that the world looks at the way that we live and they ask the question that the Bible poses that, that we wish others to ask, what is the reason for the hope that's within you? So we don't despair like others. We aren't hopeless like others. We don't suffer in the same way, perhaps in the same experience, but we don't interpret suffering in the same way as the world does. We don't believe that we're unloved. We don't believe that we came of a blob of cells or some relative of a primate because we believe that God purposed us individually as a race of humans and individually that God has a purpose that brings meaning to our lives. Unlike those who spend a whole lifetime questioning, why am I here? and many decide that they shouldn't be here yeah. and take their own lives. We're not that people. Now, sure, is there controversy and difficulty and sickness and uh, self-destruction within the Christian community? Yes. But we do not live like those without hope. So in... Um, in humility, let's take a look at verse 3 of chapter 12 to begin our uh, Roman study. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. And, and by the way, this epistle to Rome is an epistle to a church which, to the best of our knowledge, is never visited by Paul. Most of his epistles are, you know, you're a church that I started, I want to keep in touch with you, here's some things that I'm hearing about, you know, good for you, pat you on the back, um, spank you, whatever. But, but this, this is, he, he's addressing um, the, the doctrinal issue that is facing the church in Rome. I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Now, this idea of humility in the living of our lives and the sharing of our faith is one that we've already talked about because it's a very common theme throughout 
uh, the epistles throughout the New Testament, uh, and even in the Old Testament. Um, what does God require of you? Uh, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's one of my favorite verses. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. And then he talks about this great analogy. Now, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another, according to the grace given to us. Now, this is all an explanation of why we should not think of ourselves more highly than others. We are given different gifts. So, one of the things that um, is troubling about living in Christian community is that we are all maturing at different levels. We're all finding and exercising our different gifts. And because we find a great assurance and comfort in what God has revealed to us at our particular point in our Christian development, we assume that other people that claim to be Christian ought to be living just like that and ought to have just that understanding and ought to be exercising just that gift. I think I've used this illustration before um, that there are a few people more critical of smokers than people that have quit smoking. Um, and, and so what Paul is saying here is, is you're gifted differently uh, other people are maturing at a different rate, and we'll talk about this again in, in later passages. So just stay in your lane, calm down, do what you've been called to do, and stop pointing your fingers at other people because they're not living the way that you do. Now, if you want to build them up, if you want to admonish them, if you want to edify them, if you want to correct them, if you feel led to help mentor them and bring them into a, a place of maturity, that's wonderful. But to say, why don't you do this? Because that's something you're doing, I think contradicts this very teaching. So we go down to verse 9, and Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. Now, we all kind of interject some suppositions about people, and it's no less true about Paul. I see Paul as a very fiery, vigorous, um, those are just words I've heard in the press lately. Um, <laughs> somebody that has a, a clear idea about what ought to be and that feels a, a pastoral shepherding <coughs> compulsion to help correct people. And so if you were to list your assumptions about, say, the top three or four or five characteristics of Paul the Apostle, I'm not sure that a loving guy would be in that top five. That's just my image. Because um, although what we kind of think from historical conjecture and a few little cues, uh, clues here and there, we think Paul was an unattractive fellow we think he was kind of short, kind of bow-legged, probably couldn't hardly see near the end of his ministry. That may have been the thorn in the flesh, we don't know. Um, but he's also a combat veteran. Yeah. I, I have been um, touched by having conversation with ordinary people, old veterans, who don't always tell their war stories, but sometimes it kind of leaks out. Um, I was talking to an old 
older uh, gentleman uh, where I was interim pastor back in Missouri. I was sitting with him in his home near the hot, my pot belly stove. And I said, well, what did you retire from? He said, I was a welder. Where did you learn that trade? He said, in the army. Uh, so I asked him a little bit about that. And just in conversation, he kind of went into a place that I couldn't enter just mentally. And he said, I did not want to kill that guy. I did not want to kill that guy. So he'd lived since World War II. He'd lived with uh, his coming face to face with the Japanese soldier and having to take that soldier's life. Um, I didn't know that. There was a very bookish clerk that worked at a title company. Um, and uh, it, uh, it actually came out in a newspaper article, one that he, I'm sure, did not promote but uh, found out that this bespectacled guy looking through old pages and journal entries and you know stamping things and writing little notes was on the beach in Normandy D-Day. Standing in front of a hero, didn't even know it. Yeah. So, um, and, there, and I could tell you many other stories um, about that, I've been, I've been honored to be in the presence of many heroes and honored to be a listening ear um, to stories that they often uh, do not tell. My own dad and uncle were in combat zones in World War II. I know my uncle was wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, and, uh, but neither one of them, man, I, I just, as a kid, I wanted to hear war stories. Not gonna happen. Now, my dad and his brother, my uncle, would occasionally exchange knowing glances, uh, and Dad was very humble about his service, and I don't know what he did, and I think maybe he didn't tell some stories in deference to his own brother. I, I don't know, but but Paul was a combat veteran. I mean, and he'll tell you, yeah, been beaten, been stoned, been left for dead, been attacked by animals, been thrown out of town, all those different kinds of things, gone hungry, uh, Shipwreck, didn't know if he was going to live from one day to the next. And in all of that toughness and roughness and trauma and background, here we have him saying, let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil and cling to what is good. I am struck that um, Christian character and Christian love doesn't come naturally. It is a learned uh, habit of discipline that occurs. Now certainly when people are saved, they should have almost instantly a new perspective about others because they realize that they were unworthy and yet the Lord has accepted them into their family. And so that should immediately say, oh, well, I'm gonna love others because whether they deserve it or not, I didn't, and here I am. Um, but there are many things about Christian living that require intentionality and discipline. Outdo one another in showing honor. We naturally want to put people in ranks and tiers, T-I-E-R-S, and classifications. And this person's smarter than this person, this person's richer than this person, this person's wiser than this person. Um, I had a student when I was working at the high school that said, you look like you've lived a lot of life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, this person's more spiritual, this person. And, and, and so we tend to do that. And what Paul is saying, look, and he's talking specifically about the Christian fellowship right now. Um, he, he says, everybody is deserving of honor and you should honor those persons. Mm -hmm. So if there's somebody that you think, oh, you know, I don't really want them in our group or um, somebody we might roll our eyes when they darken the door of the church, or somebody that we don't particularly enjoy being around because humans are humans, we have our preferences, not everybody's gonna be my best buddy. Um, all of my best friends live out of town. I don't know who moved away first, 
Um, but we still give honor. We give honor. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And Paul spends a pretty significant number of words talking about how we treat our enemies and how that is in contrast to the world. Because he also says at various points in scripture, we were enemies of God. We were at enmity with God. And even in the Old Testament, despite all the blood and the battles and the conquering, there is teaching about hospitality and there's teaching about entertaining the stranger and they're teaching about uh, forgiving one's enemies. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, including your enemies. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. <coughs> Commentators are not absolutely in agreement about what that means. Uh, it's probably a hyperbole, obviously. We're not actually going to say, um, you know, I know you're my enemy and I'm going to be nice to you, and because of that, you're going to feel like your soul's on fire. <laughs> and uh, one kind soul that I know um, said that this is a metaphor for how people used to uh, heat something up as headgear and, and, and help them during the cold times. It was actually a very beneficial, kind thing to do. Nah, I don't think so. Uh, it could be. Um, but I think it simply means it will prick their conscience. It will make them think differently. And isn't that our goal? And I've said before, this is a strategy that you may want to employ Sometimes we need to be careful to, to label people as our enemy, even if we don't think that they're trying to kill us or destroy us or something, but, but they're in opposition to the way we want to feel or the, what we want to do. If we label them as an enemy, what then does that require of us? Makes you have to pray for them and be kind to them. Yeah. Just like in Matthew 18, in that reconciliation process, where it says if you don't get agreement after you've confronted the person, you've taken a witness, you've taken it before the church, then you can treat them like a heathen. Well, how are we supposed to treat the heathen? We're, we're, we're supposed to pray for restoration and for salvation for the heathen. Um, so this dealing with our enemy thing is a real um, testing point for the Christian. Now, if you are like me, that is a human being, you have had somebody in opposition to you in your life. Somebody that wanted to play chess with your career, interfere with your relationship, uh, make you do something that you don't want to do. Um, and, I, and I've struggled with forgiveness uh, for a former employer that was over 40 years ago. Um, so our kindness to those who would want to do us harm or ill is an important disciplined aspect of Christian conduct. Now, if that doesn't convict somebody got to be somebody in here that that's a convicting teaching to. Again, I always preach to the mirror. Then that's a good enough lesson to justify our teaching today. Now when we uh, join back together and we go to chapter 13, which you may want to read if you have not read it recently, it talks about the Christian's duty to government, and that is a potentially um, confusing maze to navigate, and, uh, but we'll be taking a look at that next week. Let's pray.